Tonight on Primetime Politics, saying sorry. All of us who were in this house on Friday regret deeply having stood and clapped, even though we did so unaware of the context. The Prime Minister apologizes for last Friday's diplomatic debacle, but does so on behalf of Parliament while still laying blame on Anthony Rhoda. The Speaker was solely responsible for the invitation and recognition of this man and has wholly accepted that responsibility and stepped down. Are the Prime Minister's words enough to heal open wounds and how is the opposition responding? This is Primetime Politics. Hello everyone, I'm Michael Serapio. For days now, opposition Conservatives have been calling on the Prime Minister to apologize, urging him to take personal responsibility for the presence in the House of Commons of a Ukrainian veteran who fought for the Nazis while Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky addressed Parliament. It was a diplomatic embarrassment, one that provided the Kremlin ammunition in its propaganda war and undercut the solemnity and power of Zelensky's visit to Canada. Both facts addressed by the Prime Minister when he spoke today. On behalf of all of us in this House, I would like to present unreserved apologies for what took place on Friday and to President Zelensky and the Ukrainian delegation for the position they were put in. For all of us who were present to have unknowingly recognized this individual was a terrible mistake and a violation of the memory of those who suffered grievously at the hands of the Nazi regime. So an apology on behalf of Parliament, but Conservatives say that's not enough. They say the Prime Minister must accept personal fault, and the NDP are looking for a plan to repair the damage that's been done. Again, he deflects blame and responsibility for his personal failings. It is the duty of the Prime Minister to protect our diplomatic reputation. It was therefore his duty to ensure that his diplomatic intelligence and security forces ensure there was no one who could potentially present a danger either to the reputation or to the physical safety of the people present at such a massive international event. But today, he said he did none of those things, and instead, after he found out about it, he hid in his cottage for three days. Is that what it means to take responsibility for this Prime Minister? The Prime Minister has said that he was embarrassed about what happened in the chambers. But it's not about him. It's much more than that. Real damage has been done. Real damage to the Jewish community. Real damage to the war effort in Ukraine. And real damage to Canada's reputation. Now, finally, after three days, the Prime Minister has finally said something, but he's got to take action. What is he going to do in concrete terms to clean up this mess? Here, here, here. Well, we want to bring into the conversation now Michael Levitt. He is the president and the CEO of the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center. And from 2015 to 2020, he was the Liberal MP for the riding of York Center in Toronto. Mr. Levitt, good to see you again. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me on, Michael. Well, as you know, uh, opposition Conservatives, they have been demanding the Prime Minister apologize for what happened last Friday and today on behalf of all Parliament. We did hear Justin Trudeau apologize. I'm wondering if you thought that was appropriate, whether it was sufficient. What would you say to that? Yeah, you know, we, we appreciated the apology. And by we, I mean the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Centre. We appreciated the apology. Uh, we particularly appreciated that it reflected on the harm caused to the Jewish community, um, Holocaust survivors, and uh, other um, communities uh, victimized by the Nazi regime. And I think also importantly, given the international ramifications and fallout that have existed um, in the aftermath of uh, uh, Mr. Hanka you know, being lauded in Parliament, uh, the mention of our allies in Ukraine was incredibly important, in particular, of course, um, President Zelensky, a, a, a Jew who uh, has pushed back um, against, uh, you know, remembrance and glorifying of uh, the very types of units that uh, Mr. Hunka was in, was important that we expressed, uh, that the Prime Minister expressed, um, you know, an understanding of the impact on the Ukrainians. Does it matter that the apology was not a personal apology, but on behalf of all Parliament? 
I think it's time for us to move on from discussions about what kind of apologies or when or how. Um, it was an apology. We've seen the resignation of uh, Speaker Anthony Rhoda. Um, I, you know, I, I, it's time to start um, repairing the harm. And we were very clear. We wanted um, to hear from the Prime Minister, to hear his reflection um, on the impacts this has had on the Jewish and many other communities. We got that today. Um, now let's start, uh, you know, mending and working to repair the damage done. Uh, I'm wondering when you say repair the damage, what else would you like to see? What lessons do you think need to be taken out of the incidents that happened on Friday? I think there's some immediate things, and I think there's some longer term kind of bigger picture things. In the immediate, um, we've called for there to be uh, a, a parliamentary hearing, I would think potentially through PROC, um, although, you know, I, I, my, my parliamentary um, mind is not as sharp as it used to be in terms of kind of protocol, but potentially PROC looking into, again, this issue of um, vetting and security on the Hill, visitors coming on. Um, it's been a very tangled web of explanations um, in terms of speaker's office versus sh sergeant at arms and, and uh, who has, you know, authority and, and, and how things are getting vetted. Let's get some answers on how this happened, but more importantly, Michael, let's get some answers to make sure that that that, uh, that uh, um, protocols are put in place to ensure it never happens again. Um, I, I'm sure you know Michael Mostyn of uh, B'nai B'rith Canada, and we, it was interesting to, to read a bit of his comments today, because he, he says this episode is a reminder that Canadians need to know more about the Nazis and the Nazi allies who were allowed to enter Canada after World War II. Uh, and in the mid-'80s, as you know, there was the Duchenne Commission uh, concluded that there were Nazis who settled here after the Second World War. But they never made public the second part of their report, uh, specifically on the people who did gain access to Canada. What should happen on that front, given what took place here last Friday? So I think you've raised two important points um, uh, with that, and, and uh, I, I concur with a lot of um, what Michael Mostyn at B'nai B'rith has, has said on this issue. Uh, let me address the first issue first, though, and that was the point about people not being aware, not having an understanding of uh, of the Holocaust and the dynamics in Europe and history, Canadian history, international history writ large. Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center is an organization that is focused um, and foundational uh, to us is Holocaust education and remembrance, as well as um, education on genocide and on human rights. And if one glimmer of light can come out from the darkness of this situation, it's a reaffirmation um, of the importance of Holocaust education and remembrance. Uh, in Ontario, uh, uh, Minister Stephen Lecce and the current provincial government have brought in a revised curriculum for grades six and seven to have Holocaust education. Uh, it exists already in the higher grades. This is an opportunity to be able to spread that message across Canada and to have Holocaust education standards reflected in other provinces. And not just for students, I think for teachers, for parents, hey, for parliamentarians, for all of us, it's an opportunity to reflect on the importance of um, a greater understanding of that one of the darkest chapters in history. Um, on the issue of the Duchesne Commission, um, yes, there has been um, a, some information that has uh, been provided uh, over the years, but a lot is still unknown and a lot is still redacted. And we would like to see uh, th that information being released. Um, it's something that B'nai B'rith has been calling for for a while now, and we certainly support their efforts. Michael Levitt, always appreciate the time. Thank you for this. Thank you very much, Michael. Meanwhile, by the end of this evening, Anthony Rhoda's tenure as Speaker for the House of Commons will come to an end. And while we don't know who will replace him in the long term, we do know the longest serving member of Parliament will be the interim Speaker until a vote for a replacement can be held. Take a listen right now to Karina Gould, the Liberal House Leader. At the time of adjournment on Wednesday, September 27, 2023, the member of Becancourt, Nicolas Sorel, the Dean of the House, be deemed elected interim Speaker of the House of Commons until a new Speaker is elected. 
So you heard it right there. The MP for Becancourt, Nicolette Sorel, will serve as interim speaker. In other words, Bloc Québécois MP Louis Plamondon. And with more, let's go to the Hill right now and join CPAC's Andrew Thompson. So, Andrew, good to see you. Uh, tell us a bit more about this choice. And if you will, uh, walk us through what we're going to see over the next few days. Right, Michael. So the Constitution is clear the House needs a speaker. And so this agreement that's been reached with the parties for Mr. Plamondon to act as interim speaker is going to allow House sittings and House business to continue. Plamondon, as Dean of the House, as the longest serving MP, is considered to be the senior House officer when there is not a speaker. And having him in place also gives MPs a bit more time to prepare for this speaker election. That's with the National Day for Truth and reconciliation coming up this weekend and then a federal holiday on Monday. Plamondon will then be overseeing the speaker's election and the procedure for that should follow with what we've seen in recent years. Candidates will get five minutes to make their case to the House. MPs will then have a secret ballot to rank their choices. Once the winner's announced, they are ceremonially dragged to the speaker's chair where they'll give their opening remarks. Uh, but we will not get an actual vote tally. Those numbers are not released and the ballots are destroyed. Okay, so something that we'll be watching for in the next few days, again, that, that, that vote expected to happen on the Tuesday. Uh, at this point, though, Andrew, any idea who might replace Mr. Rhoda in the Speaker's chair uh, in the long term? So we don't have a confirmed list, but we do know that Deputy Speaker Chris Dontremont is running, telling reporters today he's looking for more decorum and respect in the chamber, and that he is also looking for a review of the process of vetting guests in the wake of what happened last week. Now, Dontremont is a conservative, and he also says there are talks among opposition parties to try and get a speaker from the opposition benches. That has not been the case since Liberal Peter Milliken in 2011. Now, there are also two assistant deputy speakers that we are watching. New Democrat MP Carol Hughes from Ontario is also expected in the running, along with Quebec Liberal MP Alexandra Mendez, who says she has the experience, the knowledge, and the humor that's required for the job. Andrew, thank you for that. CPAC's Andrew Thompson on the Hill. Francois-Philippe Champagne is Canada's Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry. He joins us right now. Uh, Minister, thank you for being here. Uh, you are releasing today a voluntary code of conduct for the development of artificial intelligence, which I do want to talk about, but I think you'll understand when, when I say that I first want to ask you not only about the Speaker's resignation, but the, but the apology that we heard from the Prime Minister today on behalf of Parliament for what happened on Friday. Did it take too long for the Prime Minister to apologize? Why was that not more forthcoming? Well, I think first and foremost, this was a really sad day yesterday. Uh, I can tell you as a parliamentarian, um, you know, a, a terrible mistake was made, uh, which hurt uh, Jewish communities in Canada and around the world, uh, Ukrainian communities. Um, um, I think the Speaker uh, obviously was first to express apology, which is right, because, you know, in our system, there's a lot of trust between parliamentarians and the speaker. He's the ultimate authority in the House. And uh, when he asks to someone to be recognized, it's his prerogative. So I think it was right for him uh, to do that. Uh, he did the honorable thing to resign as well. I think in, in the sequence of things, that's, that's how it should be, because you have to distinguish that between the government. I think what the prime minister said, and I've not seen because I was here today, but what I understand, expressing himself on behalf of parliamentarians uh, is, is right. But in terms of the sequence, um, the speaker assumed responsibility for what happened, uh, expressed uh, deep sorrow. This is a terrible mistake that should never have happened. And I think there'll be a lot of reflection as to say, what's the process for people to be recognized, uh, for example, in the House of Commons. But, but I think in terms of steps, uh, it was for the speaker and the speaker and all to speak on behalf of parliamentarians and, and assume uh, responsibility for this terrible mistake. And that's why the prime minister was not more forthcoming more quickly with this apology, that the speaker needed to step down first? Well, I think it, it's for the speaker because that, that was a guess of the speaker that I know for folks who are listening, uh, these things, uh, you know, people may not know, for example, exactly the procedure of the house but but it's really the speaker who invited uh, the individual who recognized him and like i said 
it, it was, in my view, uh, the right thing uh, for him to uh, express uh, uh, the sorrow, a uh, very deep sorrow, uh, on behalf of parliamentarians. And, and he realized that there was a breach of trust uh, with colleagues because he's elected by all parliamentarians. So when you talk about parliament, is the voice of parliament, and I think it was right for him uh, to do uh, so, and, and he did it. And now, you know, the prime minister on behalf of uh, parliamentarians of parliament, uh, I think, is hopefully, uh, you know, people around the world would see uh, the sorrow of all of us uh, parliamentarians, and, and hopefully uh, we can learn from that. Okay. Well, listen, let's switch over now uh, to this voluntary code of conduct on artificial intelligence. Again, you released it today. But, you know, what's interesting about this, uh, Minister, is that right now it's voluntary. Is that because the technology is developing faster than federal officials can comprehend its impact? Well, no, I would say it, it's a step. You know, uh, we have Bill C-27 in the House uh, that we introduced about a year ago. Uh, but we understand in a minority parliament, uh, you know, it, it's taking time. And we see uh, the evolution of technology, which is going at, at light speed. So a bit like you've seen with President Biden at the White House inviting the tech giants in the United States, uh, we said we need like a stopgap measure. We need an interim measure to restore trust so we can talk about innovation. We need from, from fear to opportunity. And, and for me, that's, that's the basis of the code, is that we have a voluntary code of conduct but obviously, we're going to have a legal framework that will put Canada uh, as, as a leader in the world when it comes to artificial intelligence. And that's why, for me, it was so key uh, that we could have this interim step, uh, which will be complementary, obviously, to the law. But before we have a legal framework, we needed to hack to make sure that, that we protect uh, Canadians. And I think it's going to give companies who subscribe to the code a competitive advantage because uh, there, there's issues around uh, safety, transparency. I mean, today, uh, you don't know if you're applying for a loan or if you're applying for an insurance policy, uh, whether this has been decided by an algorithm or is that a human? Uh, did we look at your postcode? Did we look at your gender? I mean, we need more transparency. We need people to know who they're dealing with and, and, and certainly have some, you know, framework around that. And the Code of Conduct is doing exactly that. Okay, so framework, voluntary at this point. Does that mean then that when you speak to the industry here in Canada, the tech industry in this country, that they are already buying into this, this Code of Conduct? Or is this a bit of a, a pulling them towards these standards? Well, I, they were part of it. You know, we, we framed something. And you have some of the biggest companies in Canada. I can think about open text. I can think about Coveo, I can think about Coheer. You have some of the biggest name in Canada uh, which have subscribed because they see a benefit, first of all, because they, uh, they think that having a framework is going to allow is going to allow for responsible innovation. So uh, they see a benefit in that and they see a benefit in, in storing a relationship of trust with their customer uh, that they know that, that the systems are being used responsibly. And that will allow them to innovate faster. We want uh, to foster innovation in this country. We've been a leader with France when it came to uh, the global partnership on uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, we want to continue to lead in the world. And for me, leading was making sure that we have a framework so that companies operating in Canada can refer to and, and give trust to their customer that they're, they're acting responsibly. And then we'll have a legal framework hopefully as soon as we can. As soon as we can, and again, that sets up this Artificial Intelligence and Data Act that you're talking about. So what can we expect out of that? Will that actually have more teeth to enforce the standards that you're trying to bring about with this voluntary code right now? Well, certainly, I mean, the code is voluntary. The, the, the framework we're gonna put, and I think we're gonna be the first country in the world uh, to have a legal framework. So uh, clearly, uh, the framework is, is going to be uh, uh, with, with tools. Uh, we'll have a, a we'll have not only a privacy commissioner, but we'll have an artificial intelligence and data commissioner. Um, so that 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 person will have powers uh, to make sure that people respect uh, uh, what's going to be in the law. And the law is going to be based on principles that that will be um, the foundation for regulation as the technology evolves. So. Uh, on one end, the, the code is voluntary, but, but the, the framework, the legal framework will allow, um, obviously, for, um, you know, uh, sanctions if people were not to be following uh, the, the regulatory framework we're going to be putting in place in Canada. But the whole thing is that this should spur innovation. This is about, you know, restoring trust so that we can 
uh, go forward with innovation because AI uh, can do great things. You've seen in many industries, you should see the small and medium-sized businesses around here, uh, technologies that, that will be helping companies to be more productive, uh, more innovative. I mean, AI uh, has the potential to really uh, be a game changer in so many industries. So we want that to happen. But for that, we need to have a framework so that things uh, evolve responsibly. Minister, really appreciate the time today. Thank you for it. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. To Manitoba now, as the provincial election campaign is in its final week, in just six days' time, Manitobans should know which party will form the next government. Heather Stephenson, the PC leader, asking Manitobans to give her party a third straight mandate. But if polls are to be believed, the election at this point is Wab Canoe and the NDPs to lose. Well, to talk about the Manitoba vote, we're now joined by Nigan Sinclair, columnist with the Winnipeg Free Press, and Steve Lambert, Canadian press reporter who's been covering this campaign from day one. Uh, hello to both of you. Hello. Hello. Uh, listen, I want to begin uh, with general impressions here. Do you see this election as a vote to bring a party in or a vote to kick a party out? Uh, Nigan, I'll ask you to start us out. Uh, I would say that it's probably to get rid of uh, what uh, has been a very lengthy term of austerity, uh, which has resulted in record crime increases, uh, big issues involving the pandemic and healthcare and long-term care facilities, and then uh, generally the issue of uh, what is probably the biggest talked about, certainly in the last 24 hours, uh, the issue around searching the landfill for the remains of Indigenous women. Uh, it's uh, the removal of the Conservative government is really on Manitoba voters' minds. Okay, I'm going to get to that in a second, but Steve, I'll ask the same question, a uh, first question of you as well. Is this to get a party in or to get a party out? Yeah, like a, a lot of elections, um, the people, the, the low voter turnout nowadays, people are less interested, and you, the way you get people out to the polls is to uh, motivate people to, to get a government out. So, uh, like a lot of elections, uh, this is an election about a government that has been in office two terms, um, there was anger over the, you know, dating back to the pandemic. Before that, there was um, public service uh, sector cuts. Um, uh, upset a lot of people. And, um, yeah, this is an election where the, the anti-government vote is, is um, overrides the sort of pro vote for any of the other parties. Mm -hmm. Which which uh, we're seeing in the polls, uh, which I'll talk to you in a bit. But, you know, Nigan, I'll get back to you because you, you mentioned the search of the landfill site. And really, the, this past weekend, we saw the PCs uh, run a, a full page ad in the Winnipeg Free Press. Uh, basically, it featured the party stand against a search of the Prairie Green landfill. And that is, uh, for those who've not been following, where the remains, sadly, of two missing Indigenous women are feared to have been left. How important has that issue, the, the landfill search, been in this campaign? Pain. Uh, it probably didn't start out as being the number one issue, although certainly people did have it on their minds. Uh, it certainly created a lot of attention uh, and, you know, a long-term pro protest site. And, and the fact that Heather Stephenson asked for the feasibility study herself, Premier Heather Stephenson, and then upon the results coming back, uh, just generally refused. I think what she saw at that time is a general feeling within Manitoba, and we've certainly did polling at the Free Press where we've found that there is an appetite in Manitoba to reject the idea of searching the landfill for these Indigenous women and girls, regardless of how gruesome that may be. Uh, and so the concern have only recently in the days in which uh, the polls have come out to uh, show widespread support uh, growing, surging amount for the NDP. Uh, the Conservatives have turned this into a very ugly campaign, particularly in the last week. Uh, particularly last week. Uh, Steve, what would you say to the, to the landfill issue? How has that informed the way people are voting, even beyond the issue itself? Does it signal something to Manitoban voters about the choice they're about to make? Well, as Negan pointed out, there was a free press uh, CTV poll done by Probe Research that, that suggested that people are relatively evenly split on it. And it, it might not have been a, a major election issue. The way it came up was a bit surprising because it came up in the leaders' debate last week. And uh, Heather Stephenson raised it, went on the offensive with it, which I think surprised everybody. Um, it raised it as an issue to sort of go against Wab Canoe and the NDP uh, in the debate at the first opportunity she had to ask a question of another leader under that debate format, 
she raised the landfill issue and went after the NDP on it to, to clarify their stance and to explain why they would uh, support a search given the feasibility study. Mm -hmm. So that was surprising. And then, then the ads came out in the newspaper, a full page ad on a few issues, but that was a major one. And then um, we, a bunch of us got the same advertisement in our mail. They got a direct mailer in the last couple of days out to a lot of households in Manitoba on this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, digging down on, on the issue, if you will. But, you know, the polling numbers have been tipped to the NDP's favor. You, you both referenced the, the probe research one. And clearly, the, it shows the NDP on the verge of having the vote of, of one out of every two voters, 50 percent of voters in the province. Talk to us, Nigan, about how that has affected the PC campaign and what we're now seeing in the last days of this uh, election campaign. Well, the main problem with the in vote the vote for the NDP and the fact that they're surging is their vote is not efficient. It's mostly centralized around uh, Winnipeg, perhaps one riding in Brandon and a few ridings, a few rural ridings. Uh, but generally, uh, it's overwhelming support, almost a 20 point lead in the city of Winnipeg for the NDP. And what that says is, is that it's going to be a tight election and it's about who can get out the vote now. And uh, the NDP ground game is starting to overtake the conservative ground game, uh, even in the rural areas. Uh, I was out in the rural areas this morning. And you see people around the clock, uh, particularly those who are interested in removing the government, who are moving towards the NDP, even in fairly staunchly held conservative ridings. So those ridings are becoming a bit tighter. Uh, but generally, the NDP is walking away with Winnipeg really over the issue of health care. Uh, the closing of ERs by the conservative government has been widespread, widespread condemned, and people are really angry about that. And so uh, the NDP has come out to say they will open up ER facilities that have been closed in the past, and that generally has been really that one tipping point issue. Okay. Steve, what are you going to be watching out for? We have a few days left in this campaign before voting day next week. What, what are you actually watching out for in, in, in these last hours and days? Well, I'm going to disagree with Negan a bit here. Um, it, the NDP vote within Winnipeg and 32 of the 57 seats in the legislature are in Winnipeg. The NDP vote in Winnipeg can be very efficient when the Liberal vote drops sharply. Uh, and polls suggest the the, the, the polls suggest the Liberal vote has dropped in half from the last election. If those numbers hold, a lot of the seats that the Tories might win narrowly could go to the NDP. And it's a situation we saw in 2011 where the Liberal vote collapsed, the NDP got 46% of the popular vote province-wide, the Tories were not far behind at 43.5, but the seat count was 37 for the NDP and uh, 19 for the Tories. So that, if, if this scenario holds, if the poll numbers hold, um, there, there could be a larger than expected NDP majority, given the efficiency of the vote in Winnipeg. What we'll be watching for in the next few days is what are the Liberals going to do to shore up their support, whether um, the Tories continue to play defense. We've been seeing, seeing them just highlighting held ridings, cabinet ministers who are fighting for re-election. Uh, they're not on offense. And the NDP is on offense. The NDP today went into St. Boniface, held a press conference. Wab Canoe spoke in French. St. Boniface is the French part of Manitoba. Um, and uh, they're going after a seat held by Liberal leader Dougal Lamont. And they brought in uh, Labour's doing a bit of a blitz there. The NDP are really targeting that one. And we've seen that in this election where the NDP goes into some of the South Winnipeg ridings that have uh, traditionally been Tory. They're playing offense, the Tories are playing defense, and we're looking to see where those seats, where the battlegrounds are in the final days. Well, we will be, uh, we, CPAC, will be there uh, for election night, so we'll be watching very closely. And listen, again, Steve, thank you for the insight. Really appreciate the time tonight. You're welcome. You actually think. And that is primetime politics for this Wednesday evening. I'm Michael Serapio. For everyone here at CPAC, thank you for watching. Up next, L'Essentiel avec Esther Bejean.